Hey guys, um, so I'm watching this documentary on uh, John Lennon and, and Yoko Ono, and first of all, I, I'm ashamed to say I didn't realize how, how much Yoko helped John, and in fact, she wrote some of, uh, many of his lyrics. Um, I, I, I didn't realize that, and you can see that uh, John trusted her a great deal, um, and you can see that she also was able to provide input because she did let him um, sort of trying to think of the word, um, exhibit himself in the most comfortable way possible, which oftentimes meant sort of, you know, interrupting her, um, but not, not intentionally, uh, but just because he had so much creativity that had to get out, um, that, you know, you can sense that she let him be in charge, so to speak, um, you know, but, but also understood that, you know, when he did inter interrupt her, he wasn't doing so as a sign of disrespect. Um, and that certainly, you know, it, it certainly doesn't come across that way uh, because it does seem like he was simply, you know, happy to have somebody that understood him and that was in a position to be uh, a collaborator. And I don't know if it's 50-50. Um, like, like I said, one of his songs was uh, I'm Not a Jealous Guy or it, it's just one of his most beautiful soft songs. Um, and it starts out, I'm sorry that I made you cry. And that's interesting because, you know, I imagine, you know, a, a, being an equal in a relationship where you do have to take a back seat because you're with somebody who has a very strong personality and you're constantly in the public eye and you're trying to make a name for yourself because Yoko Ono was a performance artist, an accomplished one before she met John Lennon. And so it, it's, it's just a really interesting dynamic where, um, you know, even somebody, even, you know, like I said, I, I'd like to think I'm self-aware, but um, I didn't, like I said, I, I did not realize, you know, just how much Yoko had input uh, to the point where not only was she inspiring uh, many of his songs, but John Lennon's songs, but also, like I said, actually writing the lyrics for them. Um, so let me try to show you something here, because it's, it's the reason why, you know, we talk about John Lennon, and of course, everyone knows, you know, give peace a chance. Um, and, you know, but I think that we also don't realize just how, how many people they came into contact with. And one of them was uh, Tar Tariq Ali. And I, he's got a book. I haven't read it yet. It's, it's, I bought it, but I haven't read it yet. And you get the sense that a lot of these people uh, got inspiration from being around really bright minds. But one of the statements here in the documentary uh, really sort of, sort of hit home for me in terms of why... I'm sort of looking outwards away from the away from the U.S. Um, you know, in, in the year 2019. Let me see if I can play it for you. I'd written before and just yeah. polished them off. Yeah. So there's, there's, you know, there's a nice one called Crippled Inside. Oh. I'll play it later. We just uh, I chatted. I had to shave my moustache off and my hair cut because I went in the false papers. Yes, I read it. Because of the court. We were talking about the government. We were talking about what was going on in Vietnam, the Cultural Revolution in China, the Japanese student movement. Did I hear there's some good news on China? Well, there's some good news on uh, Vietnam. So the impression we have is that if we discussed it more concretely, the Vietnamese would be very pleased. The things that were animating them were the things that were animating our, inter you know, a whole generation, the war in Vietnam in particular. Difficult to explain now to people how much that war did to radicalize us. And the election of uh, Richard Nixon escalated the war further. I mean, they took it one whole country further by wrecking Cambodia, bombing it indiscriminately. Um, so look at the parallel between what's happened here. You have the election of a president um, that is very sort of, well, you know, I don't think Nixon was pro-military. Um, you know, so, so there are, it's, it's not a, an exact match. But you notice that people in America, that, as far as I can see, are not radicalized. To the extent that they are radicalized, um, well, first of all, it's not even, I, I don't know anybody today that's a radical. Um, and that, that, that concerns me. And so you can notice that that wasn't the case in the, you know, before 19, well, in the 1960s. You had radicals, but keep in mind, these are both British people. 
Um, I think I think what he's saying is when he came under false papers, um, what he's saying is that I'm I'm British and um, I'm here. <clears throat> um, I came to the United States to see you, um, you know, under false papers. So back in the day before we had biometric passports and and you know border security, you could do that. You could shave your mustache and go somewhere. That, that's what I think he's saying. Um, and you get the sense that in the future, you know, you're not going to have these sorts of clandestine meetings. They won't be possible anymore. And so movements will be surveilled instantaneously and therefore infiltrated. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to think what would happen to someone like John Lennon um, if you're able to simply stop him uh, from getting his message out. Because, you know, perhaps the only avenue now isn't a physical store. It might be something online. Now, we used to think... And in, in the year 2000, that going online, going digital would make things, make it easier for people like John Lennon to get their message out. But what we didn't realize is that the platforms were the ones in control. And, you know, it's not, it's one thing if the government is the one that's controlling the platform and, and spending a lot of money through nonprofits, through uh, universities in order to boost, or through police departments in order to boost certain people and certain ideas like they did with, for example, um, you know, the CIA um, in the old days would, spot, would fund uh, Gloria Steinem and William Buckley and a lot of the people that you might have seen on their, on your, in your newspaper on Sunday. And they didn't necessarily know they were being funded, but, you know, the advertising dollars and that's how the newspaper business runs. Um, and, you know, it runs on ads. And when Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg was, you know, in front of Congress and, and one of the, Orrin Hatch, one of the senators was asking him, well, how does Facebook make money? And, you know, the CEO of Facebook said, Senator, we run ads. So the business model hasn't actually changed. But what has changed is now when you are able to accept money from all over the world, um, you're able to exercise more control over who is going to be seen on that platform. And you can actually block. I mean, like I said, they, they, Facebook has actually blocked few people uh, uh, like, for example, Louis Farrakhan and Alex Jones and many other people. That Those are the prominent names. Um, you know, it's interesting because if you look at Farrakhan, um, he's clearly anti-Semitic, but he also has a lot of interesting ideas about um, Christianity. And it's, it's odd because he's part of, part of um, a, nation, a nation of Islam, which is not actually an official Islamic group. Um, it's just kind of odd to see so many biblical interpretations in his, in his Twitter feed. Um, and again, you know, this is something that I think that I, I, I should have a, I don't know if, if I should say, I should, I should have a right to see it. In a country that claims to have free speech, I should have a right to see that. Um, and in this case, I, I do have, I'm able to see it on, on a different platform, but that's only because it's a different platform. It hasn't been bought out. You can envision a situation where one day, you know, um, a few companies own many things and they both advertise and you have this sort of like going back and forth within an, an economic ecosystem where, um, like with airplanes today, where so many of them own each other, they, they're like minority shareholders of each other, or they just agree, like Uber and Grab, not to compete. These are apps that have ride sharing. Um, Grab is in Southeast Asia for the most part, and Uber simply sold its stake to Grab, and Grab does not operate in the United States to the point where I can't even upload my credit card into the app um, so that when I do go, I don't have to like get in there and start, you know, trying to figure out uh, which credit card to use. So you can get the sense that. All the ideals of the, of the dot-com bubble, um, of the dot-com boom and bust, all of them are now sort of being countered by an emphasis on security and who knows. And all that really goes back to, you know, the way that, that the, the budget and the way that the spending happens in this country, in the United States, within an overall framework of bank lending um, of alliances, not just NATO, but informal alliances with Singapore and non-NATO countries. And then we've, even within NATO, um, how that, you know, allegiance plays out um, within other organizations uh, like OPEC, for example, um, that are, you know, that have competing interests within the same organization. So it's interesting to think about all these things, but, you know, at the end of the day, I have to tell you that, like, it's it's difficult not seeing radicals in the United States. Um, and, it, and again, looking back on this, you know, it, it was a Brit, John Lennon, that was singing, give peace a chance. It was Tariq Ali, a British person, I think it's British Pakistani, that was coming to visit him. 
And I think to Phil Spector was the one that was you know, the prominent American that was in the room. And he's a businessman. And I don't know if the future is going to be businessmen taking advantage of the talents of immigrants in America. That really has been the model uh, for America's success post-World War II. Um, well, of course, actually far beyond that, if you think about slavery being um, a quote-unquote business model. So it's late here. Um, I've had a long day, but these are sort of interesting things to think about. Um, and maybe we can get some more radicals in the United States sometime, if, even if they're from another country.